CO2 emissions in 2050 are going to need to be less than half of current emissions and much less than a third of the emissions that are projected for 2050, taking into account things such as population growth and increased energy consumption. Now, there are various techniques that uh, can be used to achieve these emission reductions, and one of the most significant as shown here is the CCS, which the IEA projects will account for 14% of the overall emission reductions by 2050. The focus of CCS in the past has been on coal-fired plants, but natural gas has taken an increasing share of, of the power generation market in many countries, as shown here in this chart on the right, which shows uh, natural gas consumption for power generation in the US and how it's increased in recent years. The main reason for this move to gas, as shown here, is being the low capital costs, short build times, high efficiencies, uh, low emissions and good operating flexibility, which is becoming an increasingly important uh, issue for future electricity systems with a lot of renewables in them. The main disadvantage of gas has been historically has been its relatively high cost, but even that's no longer the case in, in many countries, particularly where there's abundance of uh, gas from shale, shale gas, etc. Even though natural gas fired power plants have relatively low CO2 emissions, about half those of a modern coal-fired plant, there's still going to be a need to uh, install CCS in future to, to satisfy the very tight uh, emission goals that are being set at places such as the, the recent COP meeting. So the question then is, which of the CO2 capture technologies should we be using for natural gas-fired power plants? Well, the technologies that are available are essentially those the same as those uh, at coal-fired power plants, namely pre-combustion, post-combustion, and oxy-combustion. Pre-combustion was one of the early leaders for uh, commercial CCS at gas-fired power plants, and as shown here, there was a project at Peterhead in Scotland, which was proposed by BP, um, uh, which was one of the early leaders of CCS. Uh, plants, but this project was cancelled in 2007 before construction could start. Uh, various studies that have been done by other people since then have shown pre-combustion to be a relatively expensive technique for gas-fired CCS, although it does have some advantages such as the ability to produce hydrogen, which could be used for decarbonizing uh, other en energy sectors. But it's generally considered to be the uh, bit of the outsider in this race for CCS at gas-fired power plants. The favourite in the race is currently post-combustion capture, and this is generally now considered to be the technology for gas-fired CCS. But, uh, and as shown here, there was, there was a project to build a, a large uh, post-combustion demonstration plant at Peterhead by Shell and SSE, but unfortunately that's been uh, put on hold and is unlikely to proceed because of uh, cuts from government funding in the UK. So that leaves us with oxy combustion, which has always historically been considered to be the, uh, the dark horse in the race. Uh, it's a bit of an outsider, but uh, it's, it's certainly not a new concept. It's been around for a while, but its profile has been increasing recently with the introduction of uh, some uh, more um, efficient and, and low cost uh, options being proposed. Um, so uh, this is going to be the subject of the, uh, the presentation today on this uh, oxycombustion techniques. In view of this increasing interest in oxycombustion, IEA GHG commissioned a technical economic assessment study of oxycombustion turbine power plants with CCS. And this was uh, done for us by Amec Foster Wheeler. And they worked in this particular study with Politecnico di Milano. Amec Foster Wheeler had done a lot of studies for IEA GHG on various uh, uh, different types of power plants with um, industrial plants with, with CCS. So that has the advantage that the assessments done in this study are consistent with on a comparable basis with assessments of other technologies. Uh, I should, should give credit to the people who worked on this study at uh, Amic Foster Wheeling Polytechnic College at Milano. They're the people shown here who did the work which I'm reporting here today. A study was published by IEA GHG in August this year, and it's available to IEA GHG's members for the first six months after publication. And after that, it'll be freely available uh, on our website for download. The first part of the study involved uh, a literature review of the broad range of oxy combustion turbine cycles that have been proposed over the years. Um, 
as I mentioned earlier, they're not a new concept, but um, there's been a lot of work going on since the early 1990s, but mainly at an academic sort of level. Having carried out this literature review, we then went on to select cycles for more detailed assessment. And this selection was based on their expected efficiencies according to the literature and the current state of development and the technological challenges they face. So obviously a good, good efficiency and low technological challenge would be the ideal, but we have to make some compromises with these different criteria. The cycles we selected were two cycles in which CO2 is the main material flowing through the turbine and two in which steam is the main material. Cycles um, mainly based on CO2 were the so-called semi-closed oxycombustion combined cycle, SCOCCC, and the alum cycle, which is being developed by NetPower. The cycles mainly using steam were the modified air scrap cycle as proposed by the University of Graz in Austria, and various cycles proposed by clean energy systems in the United States. Before going on to give descriptions of the, uh, the different oxycombustion turbine cycles, I think it's probably useful just to give a basic uh, look at what a conventional uh, gas turbine combined cycle looks like. And this is shown in simplified form here. So beginning on the left, we see air being compressed to about 17 bar in a compressor. Uh, most of this air is fed to a combustor and the resulting gas at about 1400 degrees in modern turbines is fed to an expansion turbine. A smaller fraction of the air from the compressor goes directly to the uh, to cool the hot components in the turbine to keep the metal temperature down to acceptable levels. The gas from the turbines then typically, uh, which is about typically 600 degrees, is then cooled in a heat recovery steam generator before being discharged to the atmosphere. And steam from the HRSG is used to generate more power in a steam turbine. I've only shown one steam stream here just for simplification, but in practice there's typically steam generated, generated at three levels in the HRSG just to make the best use of the heat that's available. So coming on to the first of the oxycombustion cycles, the SCOCCC, it's similar in principle as you can see to the conventional gas turbine combined cycle that I've just shown. The main difference being that instead of having air going into the compressor, we've We've now got CO2, which is recycled within the system. And the oxygen required for combustion is provided as high purity oxygen from their separation unit. In order to give a similar turbine exhaust temperature to a conventional cycle, uh, the turbine inlet pressure has to be increased from about 17 bar in the previous cycle up to about 45 bar. And this is because of the different properties, physical properties, of CO2 compared to nitrogen and oxygen, which are the main materials flowing through um, the turbine in a conventional cycle. The exhaust gas is fed to an HRSG, as in a normal uh, combined cycle, to generate some steam. Uh, the exhaust from the HRSG, though, is, is then further cooled, which condenses most of the water, and then that leaves you with a CO2 rich stream, most of which goes back to the compressor. and the net CO2 produced by the system by combustion goes off to storage. There would be a, a CO2 purification unit at the end of this cycle, which I haven't shown in this system, but it's included in the analyses. The other cycle involving mainly CO2 is the net power, powers alum cycle, which is very significantly different to the one I've just shown. Instead of operating between about 45 bar and atmospheric pressure, the turbine has a much higher inlet pressure of about 300 bar, but a lower pressure ratio uh, of about around about 10, which gives you a, a higher exhaust pressure of about 30 bar. The turbine also has a, a lower inlet temperature than the conventional uh, gas turbine, typically about 1150 degrees, um, but it also has a higher exhaust temperature of, of around about 700, 750 degrees. The turbine in this cycle is, is the main novel component. Um, it has the inlet pressure of a, an advanced supercritical steam turbine, but it has uh, a higher temperature more akin to that of a, of a gas turbine, albeit one that was produced about 25 years ago. So the inlet temperature is relatively modest for, for a gas turbine. The other big difference between this cycle and the one I, I've shown earlier is that instead of using the heat in the turbine exhaust gas to generate steam for a steam cycle, the hot turbine exhaust gas is used to reheat 
the recycled CO2. The turbine exhaust gas is then further cooled, most of the water is condensed, um, as in the earlier cycle. And the cooled CO2 is then recompressed, firstly to about 80 bar in a gas compressor. And after that, the CO2 is cooled, which condenses most of the CO2. So you can then repressure, the final repressurization using the liquid pump. And uh, repressurizing using the pump uh, uses very much less energy than repressurizing using the compressor. So that's one of the advantages of this cycle, which contributes to its high efficiency. Recycled CO2 is then split into several streams. It goes through the reheater along with some of the oxygen. Uh, but the amount of heat required to reheat the CO2 is actually greater than the amount that's available in the turbine exhaust gas. That's because uh, high density, high pressure CO2 has a relatively high heat capacity. So there's an opportunity to use some what would otherwise be waste heat from uh, the air separation unit's uh, air compressor cooler to put it into this uh, reheating system, which again contributes to the good uh, energy efficiency of this system. The net power process is actually uh, subject to quite a significant industrial development program. There's been a 10 megawatt combustor test, which has been run by Toshiba in the United States. And there are a firm project to build a 50 megawatt pilot plant in Texas, which is scheduled to start commissioning by late 2016. And the partners in this are Net, Net Power, who will provide the technology, Toshiba, who are the turbine supplier, Shaw Group doing the EPC construction work, and Exelon, which is a utility who are doing the plant operation and maintenance. And this is about a $140 million project, so a very significant industrial project. The first of the uh, steam-based cycles is shown here. This is the modified S-Grat cycle. Um, in this cycle, fuel and oxygen are fed to a combustor along with mainly steam. And then the hot gas is then expanded to atmospheric pressure in the turbine. And it's passed through a heat recovery steam generator, which generates 100 bar superheated steam, which is then fed through a steam turbine, which exhausts into the combustor. About half of the cooled gas from the HRSG, which comprises about 90% steam and 10% CO2, is recycled back to the combustor by a compressor. And the rest is compressed and used to generate low pressure steam for a separate steam cycle, which I've shown in a very simplified form here. The other steam based cycle is, is uh, being developed by clean energy systems and just before I go on to show the cycle I'll just show some of the uh, the actual practical work that they've done which is at their facility in California they've built some significant combustors as shown here a gas generator high pressure combustor and a reheater and they've also built a, an experimental turbine uh, by which has been created by modifying an existing the expansion stage of an existing gas turbine CS has been concentrating mainly on development of uh, components such as these for oxygen combustion turbines that are based on relatively conventional technology and which could be applied commercially in the fairly short term, for example, in uh, enhanced oil recovery schemes. Um, IAGHG evaluated uh, two versions of CES's cycle based on this, these sort of near-term technologies, but the the disadvantage is that they have relatively low efficiencies. So CS also proposed a, a more advanced system for the purposes of this study, uh, which is the one I'm going to focus on on this in this webinar. And this is the supercritical CS cycle as shown here. This cycle involves uh, three stages in series, each consisting of a combustor fed with fuel, oxygen and steam, followed by a turbine and a heat recovery steam generator. And the high pressure conditions in the system are similar to those in the net power cycle, i.e. around about 300 bar and 1150 degrees C. But unlike the net power cycle, the expansion goes right down to subatmospheric pressure of 0.2 bar rather than being a high pressure exhaust. So coming on to some of the results, um, the thermal efficiencies of the cycles are, are summarized here. The performance of uh, the gas turbines in this case was modified by was modeled by Politecnico di, di Milano, 
using their in-house software, and the overall plants are modelled by Amic Foster Wheeler using mainly Aspen's uh, software. The efficiency of the a reference NGCC based on an airblown F-class gas turbine was 58.9% on a lower heating value basis. And the efficiency of the net power system with CCS is 55.1%, giving a, an efficiency penalty for CO2 capture of only 3.8 percentage points, which is a very low uh, efficiency penalty compared to uh, other technologies and other fuels. The other oxy-combustion turbine cycles were having efficiencies of around about 40 9%. They're not necessarily the very best you could do. I'm sure there's some more optimization you can do to improve these efficiencies, but uh, these are all on a comparable basis. The developers of NetPower and CES, uh, are we, we were in some discussions with them during the course of this study, which were very useful, and we were very grateful for the input they provided. But they both came up with uh, their own efficiency estimates, which were about three or four percentage points higher than the efficiencies shown here. And the differences between the developers' estimate predictions uh, and those in this study are described in, in uh, some detail in the, in the uh, detailed report, so I won't go into those uh, in any more detail at this point. Amec Foster Wheeler estimated the capital costs of plants with net power outputs between 750 and 900 megawatts on a Netherlands location, and the costs are shown in, here in this slide. And these are total plant costs, which exclude owner's costs and interest during construction. Although I should emphasize that we did take all these extra costs into consideration when we came on to calculate uh, electricity generation costs. You can see that the plants with CCS have capital costs, which are roughly double those of the, of the reference NGCC without, uh, without capture. About 50 to 60% of the cost increase is due to the cost of the air separation unit that's required to produce the oxygen for combustion. And the rest is due to a variety of, of reasons. Um, the cost of the main uh, power unit increases, partly because the efficiency goes down. Also, balance of plant items such as cooling water systems and electrical distribution are expensive. Uh, and that's, that's shown in, in this, uh, this slide. Moving on to the next slide, which shows levelized costs of electricity generation. The detailed basis for this is shown at the bottom of the slide there. For comparison, I've also included in this slide a uh, cost for a natural gas combined cycle plant with post-combustion capture uh, based on a second generation uh, solvent, i.e. not MEA, one of the more improved solvents. Uh, and this is based on an earlier study that IAGHG published in, in 2012. So adding CCS increased the levelized cost of electricity by between 34 and 52 percent, which is a smaller increase than we typically expect for adding CCS to coal-fired plants, uh, where the LCOE increase is more like around about 80 percent. The main cost for the reference plant, you can see the, the blue bar at the bottom there is the cost of natural gas, which in this study we based on eight euros per gigajoule, although Recognize that gas costs vary an awful lot around the world and, and over time as well. Uh, the natural gas cost uh, per kilowatt hour of electricity is higher in the CCS plants because of the reduced thermal efficiency. But the main reason for the higher overall uh, LCOE is the higher capital cost, which is the second, second uh, part of the bars. The cost of CO2 transport storage, which is the yellow part on the top of the bar, is relatively modest. For the purposes of this study, we based that on a cost of 10 euros per tonne of CO2 uh, transported. Obviously, this varies uh, very much depending on the site and whether you're part of a of CO2 transport and storage grid, which significantly reduce costs. But we did look at sensitivity to this in, in uh, later on in the study. The study assessed uh, sensitivities to a range of technical and economic parameters. The technical parameters we looked at are listed here, and I haven't got time to go into all of these in detail, but uh, I will just concentrate on the first two, which is turbine inlet temperatures and metal temperatures, and the percentage capture of CO2 and the CO2 purity. But the details of all of the other ones are included in the, in the study report. 
So to begin with, uh, we looked at sensitivities to combustor outlet temperature and the maximum metal temperature in the turbines. Uh, and the results are shown here for two of the cycles, the net power cycle and the SCOC-CC cycle. And you can see from the top bar that reducing the combustor outlet temperature by 50 degrees in the net power cycle reduced the efficiency by about 0.8 percentage points. But if you look at the second uh, bar down, you can see that just increasing the turbine inlet temperature didn't actually increase the thermal efficiency at all. And this is mainly because the increased uh, thermodynamic efficiency you get from a higher temperature is offset by the greater need for cooling gas to prevent the turbine uh, metal components from overheating. However, if you can uh, increase the, uh, the metal temperature in the turbines, and that's the sort of thing that may be possible in future with improved materials, and you combine that with a higher uh, turbine in that temperature, you can get quite a significant improvement in, in overall efficiency of 1.6 percentage points. So that, sh that shows, amongst other things, that this, this cycle has the potential to uh, make use of future improvements in, in turbines and turbine materials, which will take place anyway in future um, through developments in, in air blown cycles. The effects are much the same for the SCOC CC cycle, shown in the bottom two bars, but the magnitudes, the differences were, were smaller in both cases. Another sensitivity we looked at was to the percentage capture of CO2 and CO2 purity. The study was based on an assumed 90% CO2 capture rate. Uh, this is for consistency with IEAGHT's other studies of CCS technology, and it's a, a fairly standard number that's been used throughout the CCS community. However, it, it would be relatively easy to capture a higher percentage of CO2 NOx of combustion turbines if this should be necessary in future. And although 90% capture would probably be sufficient in the short term, particularly for gas fired plants with their relatively low. Uh, inherent emissions. Um, some modelling of overall energy systems with tight emission scenarios, which may well come about in future, indicates that the residual non-captured non CO2 emissions from CCS plants could be quite a significant barrier to large-scale use of CCS in the longer term. Uh, the more re residual CO2 there is from CCS plants, the more you need to reduce emissions from other sectors, such as transport and agriculture, which can be very difficult and, and very expensive. So it may be better off to capture a very high percentage of, cap of CO2 in the CCS plants that are built. Uh, we looked at this for two sensitivity cases, then looking at higher percentage capture, and we based this analysis on the net power cycle. Uh, one of the sensitivity cases we included uh, included a membrane separation unit to capture uh, more of the CO2 from the vent gas from the CO2 processing unit. This is the unit that takes out the impurities such as nitrogen and oxygen uh, from the raw CO2. Um, the cost of, or the efficiency penalty for this is, is fairly modest, about 0.4 percentage points. Um, and there's also a small increase in the capital costs and the LCOE. However, the CO2 avoidance cost actually goes down by three uh, euros per tonne of CO2 from 68 to 65. And this is because the increase in the amount of CO2 that's captured is greater than the increase in the LCOE. So this could be a worthwhile thing to do, even if you don't have to achieve very tight emission um, constraints. It's, it gives you a lower cost of CO2 avoidance. In the second sensitivity case, the CPU is eliminated altogether, so that all the raw CO2 from the cycle goes directly to storage. And this gives you essentially 100% capture of CO2. The downside of this is that the CO2 purity is lower. It's gone down from the 99.8%. In the other case, it's down to 97.9%. Um, and whether this is acceptable really depends on your CO2 transport and, and storage infrastructure. So overall, the ability to capture a high percentage of CO2 without increasing the cost of CO2 avoidance could be a significant advantage for oxy combustion turbines, and particularly so in the long term. And it may even be something that's worthwhile doing in the short term because of the lower carbon abatement cost. 
As well as the technical parameters, we also looked at sensitivities to various economic parameters that may vary over time and may vary between different locations around the world. And we're shown in these two, uh, two charts here, the sensitivities of LCOE and CO2 avoidance cost. You can see from the top chart that the LCOE is, is highly sensitive to fuel price, which is not surprising as we showed earlier that the fuel price was by far the, or the fuel cost was by far the, the biggest element of the overall cost of electricity generation. Uh, but looking down to the second chart, that you can see that the sensitivity of CO2 avoidance cost of fuel price is really much less. And that's because fuel price only affects uh, the difference between the plants with and without CO2 capture, which in the net power case is fairly modest. Uh, the costs are presented are for plants operating at base load, which we assumed in this study to be 90% annual capacity factor. Uh, but in practice, many power plants, particularly gas-fired plants, uh, are likely to operate in future at lower capacity factors because they have to respond to varying power demand and varying outputs of renewable generators. Uh, so we looked at the sensitivity case of reducing the capacity factor from 90% to 50%. And you can see this significantly increases the LCOE. But it's worth noting that the impact on the profitability of the plant may be much less because Plants that operate at low capacity factors tend to generate when electricity prices are high. So although you're not generating so many megawatts, the, the megawatts you do generate are of a higher value. So that uh, can offset much of the cost increase shown here. Although the LCOE may not vary quite so much, the, the CO2 avoidance cost shown in the, in the bottom two chart is very sensitive to capacity factor. Uh, economic discount rate we also looked at, and that has a relatively modest impact on costs. Uh, moving down the chart, you can see that CO2 transport and storage costs, we looked at a range increasing this from 10 to 20 euros per tonne, which increases the LCOE by a fairly small amount. But uh, we also recognize that in some cases, you may be able to sell the CO2 for EOR, for example. And if you could get a revenue for this of, say, 20 euros per tonne at the plant boundary, then that could make a quite significant reduction in your LCOE and your CO2 avoidance cost also. <clears throat> the base case economic evaluation didn't include any costs associated with the CO2, the non-captured CO2. If you put a cost on that, then that makes a very small uh, effect on the LCOE. And finally, in the bottom, increasing the plant life from 25 to 40 years also has a, a pretty small impact on, on, the, on the costs. Another sensitivity we looked at was uh, the cost of the innovative equipment in these cycles. There is clearly some quite significantly um, unusual bits of equipment in these cycles. Um, and the costs of these items are to some extent uncertain. So we looked at the sensitivities of LCOE to the cost of the innovative equipment. And you can see that the sensitivities are relatively modest, for example, by increasing the cost of uh, this innovative equipment in the net power cycle by 30%, you get an increase in the LCOE of only about three euros per megawatt hour, uh, which is fairly, fairly small. And it's, it's less significant in the other cycles, which don't include so much uh, unusual equipment. Another important issue for uh, power plants in general is, is operating flexibility. Uh, power plants have to respond to the changing demand for power and also the variable output from other generators, such as uh, renewable generators. And it's important they can do this quickly and without excessive costs and loss of efficiency. Well, the flexibility will depend on the detailed plant design. And unfortunately, specific information on flexibility of oxygen combustion turbine plants is not yet in the public domain. And there is a need for more information. And it's difficult to draw conclusions at this time. We did a, a brief analysis of this in the study, but uh, we recognize that it's, uh, there is more information needed. An important part of the oxygen combustion plants is the ASU. Um, this could impose some restrictions on flexibility. Uh, but there is the potential to produce and store oxygen during times of when power demand is low, and so you could turn down the ASU 
uh, use the stored oxygen when the power demand is high. And this would increase flexibility and also give an extra boost to the net power output just when you need it most when demand is high. Some of the advantages of oxygen combustion turbine cycles are water consumption. Uh, the water of combust combustion is condensed in all of these cycles, so that can be recovered. And if you combine these cycles with an air cooling system for the uh, to dissipate the waste heat instead of the normal water cooling systems, you could actually get plants which are net producers of water, and that's most unusual for power plants. We're usually concerned about power plants in many countries for us because they're large uh, consumers of power of, of water. If you can have a plant that's actually a producer of water, then that's clearly an advantage. The size of the plant can also be important in some cases, particularly for retrofits to existing sites. Uh, Oxycombustion combined cycles would have similar areas to conventional combined cycles, but the recuperative cycles, such as net power, uh, are very compact, and this could be a, an advantage on some sites. The ASU is a, a significant area requirement, rather comparable to post-combustion capture, but this could be put off site if necessary and you can just pipe the, the oxygen into the site so that's another advantage. Uh, another advantage is that uh, oxy combustion plants don't produce any solvent related waste and like post combustion capture so this again could be an advantage. Finally I'd just like to briefly summarize the work we did on uh, uh, combining oxy combustion turbines with uh, coal gasification. Uh, these cycles can use uh, synthesis gas produced by coal gasification. In this sense, they can be an alternative to pre-combustion capture, which is what you'd normally consider for, for gasification plants. We just looked at one plant, which we based on the SCOC CC cycle. Uh, and this is a plant that uses the GE Energy uh, oxygen blown in train flow gasification process which we looked at uh, in an earlier study where we looked at pre-combustion capture in IGCC. Uh, the gas from the gasifier is cooled using a radiant boiler and a quench cooling system. Unlike IGCC with pre-combustion capture though, there's no shift converter and no CO2 capture unit prior to the gas turbine. But we did include in this study, we included a, an acid gas removal system to selectively separate sulfur compounds from the fuel gas. And this is a fairly conservative assumption, uh, which we did to minimize the risk of impacts of sulfur compounds and other impurities on the turbine. If it turns out that this isn't necessary, we could eliminate this sulfur removal system and there could be some improvements to the efficiencies and costs. The results for efficiencies and costs of this system are shown here along with costs for a comparable IGCC with pre-combustion capture and also um, coal-fired plants, pulverized coal plants with and without post-combustion capture. You can see that the oxy-combustion gasification system has a similar efficiency to the, the other types of coal-fired plant with capture, but the costs are, capital costs and LCO and CAC are significantly higher. But this indicates that uh, SCOCCC cycle is not competitive for coal-fired plants. However, um, it may be worthwhile looking at gasification combined with other oxy combustion turbine cycles, and they may be significantly more efficient and um, cost competitive. So what's the way forward for oxy combustion turbines? Well, the component and cycle development program work needs to continue and we need to move forward to building and operating integrated large pilot plants to give confidence that it'll be possible to achieve the target efficiency and costs and to achieve reliable operation over extended periods of time. And it'll also be important to demonstrate uh, operating flexibility, which I mentioned earlier is going to be important in the future. The next stage then will be to roll out the technologies in full commercial size plants. And it's important that this is done relatively quickly, as quickly as possible to meet timescales, not only for emission reductions, uh, but also achieve cost reductions through learning by doing, uh, to maintain cost competitiveness with other low carbon technologies whose costs are also expected to reduce in the future. So finally, just a few conclusions. Um, 
The opposite combustion turbine power plants were predicted in the study that IEGHG carried out to be in the range of 49 to 55%, which is broadly similar range to the efficiency of conventional gas turbine with post combustion capture using one of the current improved solvents, which would be about 52%. Although the most efficient of the oxygen combustion turbine cycles has a higher efficiency, significantly higher efficiency than, than post combustion capture. The capital cost LCOE and cost of CO2 avoidance were also estimated to be broadly similar to post combustion capture, although we recognize that there are uncertainties in the cost, not only of the oxygen combustion, but also in the post combustion capture plants. So it's difficult to pick a clear winner out of, of, out of this comparison. Oxygen combustion has some other advantages, including the potential to capture nearly 100% of CO2, potential for low water use, uh, small plant sizes, and the ability to use off-specification fuel gas, such as natural gas with high CO2 concentrations. In order to get more definitive performance and cost data and to provide confidence for investors, uh, it's important that we work to build and operate power plants and this work continues and it has a successful outcome. So thank you for your attention. Uh, I welcome any questions either through this uh, webinar process or please give me an email afterwards if, if you have any further queries. Well, John, thank you very much for such a sort of a helpful summary of something that looks a very, very complex report. Um, you've invited questions. We have several coming in. <laughs> There is one that I am happy to say that I can actually answer, and that was, will the presentation be available afterwards? And that's yes, we will put it um, available on our website. We'll um, email you or the link. John, I'm afraid the rest are down to you. Um, one question, first question, really, hopefully quite a simple one. Do you know the location of the Net Power Pilot Plant? Uh, the Net Power Pilot Plant is in Texas. I couldn't say specifically, I have the information, which I can let you know later by email, but it, it is in Texas. Lovely, thank you. And we'll um, email out answers as well to all the questions uh, within, well, probably be the new year now. But uh, um, Next question then, in your CO2 purity figures, where the, CO2, the purity wasn't 100%, mm -hmm. what makes up the balance? Is it moisture? It's, it's not moisture because we need to remove nearly all of the moisture uh, to avoid corrosion in the pipeline. So there would there is specifically a, a de dehydration unit built into the CO2 processing unit. Most of the impurity is nitrogen and argon, which comes in to the system mainly th along with the, the oxygen. It's the minor impurity in there and a little bit in the natural gas as well. Okay, thank you. And do you know if um, Maersk has got anywhere with marketing its Trigen system, which was based on the on the CES system? I'm I'm not aware of them of any of any no act, activity on that. Yes, I've seen. Okay. Yes, we're aware of that. Sorry, putting you on the spot a little mm -hmm. there. Um, and do you have any efficiency in capital on the LCOE comparisons when including CCS at the back end of NGCCC? There was there's one of the slides which shows um, an LCOE comparison with this is with post combustion capture on applied to an NGCC. Okay, um, sorry, that possibly came in before uh, we yeah, got to yeah, that slide. Yeah, um, but there is there is comparable um, capital costs and efficiencies in one of our other studies published in 2012 as well. If you want more detail on that. Okay. And question just coming in. Can you explain again why you think that increasing the combustor outlet temperature in the net power cycle mm -hmm. does not increase the, efficient, the efficiency significantly? In, just increasing the combustor outlet temperature on its own uh, results in a greater quantity of the CO2 needing to be fed to directly to the turbine to cool the metal components. And that that reduces the amount of heat that you can recover into that that stream, and it also reduces the efficiency of the turbine, offsetting some of the um, increase that you would normally expect in the turbine by increasing the turbine inlet temperature. But when you, if you can operate the the 
the material from the turbine at a hotter temperature, then you certainly get a, a much better efficiency. Okay, thank you. And the next one coming through. Um, to what extent does the alum net um, power cycle require re-engineering the ASU for optimised integration? It does require some. What, what the net, what, what you have in a normal ASU is an intercooled compressor where you compress the the air feed partly, you cool it, and you compress it another stage and cool it. And that's the most efficient system to do in a normal ASU. Whereas in the net power system. Because you can use some, or there is a requirement for additional low-grade heat in the in the reheating of the CO2. What you would normally do is just have a single stage of compression without intercooling and have a hotter compressor outlet temperature and recover heat from that. So it's a bit of a different uh, design than you'd use in in a conventional ASU. And you're also producing also requiring oxygen at very high pressure. Clearly, it's got to go up to 300 bar to get into the combustor, and that's not something that you'd normally have in a conventional ASU. So that's an additional development requirement. Thank you. And um, do you know if there are any options considered for nitrogen from the ASU and the process integration mm -hmm. with the OxyGT proposed configurations, or is the integration with the ASU only on the interstage cooling heat level? It's I'm not aware of any process integration for use of the nitrogen, no. Okay. Um, I think we've exhausted our time now. Um, so there are a couple of questions that we haven't actually managed to get round to, but I think we will have to leave these and get back to these via email, which is so okay. we'll uh, ask John to address and uh, send out to everyone in the new year and with that I think wish you a Merry Christmas and thank you very much for attending and goodbye. Yes, thank you. Goodbye.